Good morning and good afternoon to everyone on this third quarter 2022 ISG Global Index call. I'm Aditya Budhavarapu of Bank of America, and I'd like to thank the team at ISG for their valued work on the industry and for asking us at Bank of America to introduce this call today. ISG has been hosting these index calls on the technology services market for 20 years. The ISG advisors and analysts work with, entrepreneur, with, work with enterprise buyers and service providers, so they offer unique insight to key industry trends it is critical as we navigate all of the unexpected events that can impact markets in an uncertain environment. I'll turn the call over to Stanton Jones, Distinguished Analyst at ISD. Thanks, Aditya, and hi, everyone. With me today is Steve Hall, Partner and President of ISG EMEA, Kathy Rudy, Chief Data and Analytics Officer, and Namratha Darshan, Research Director and Principal Analyst. As Aditya mentioned, we've been hosting the index call for 20 years now. That's 80 consecutive quarters. So just to give you a sense of how much this research program has grown over the years, we had 45 attendees on the first index call all the way back in 2002. And on this call today, we'll pass over 30,000 total attendees over the past two decades. So I'd like to recognize our incredible index team, both my teammates you'll see here on the call today, and especially those that have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this call happen rain or shine for 20 years now. So let's go ahead and jump into our analysis. Steve, over to you for the big three thoughts on the quarter. Great. Thanks a lot, Stanton. And uh, again, congratulations to the entire team. 20 years of doing the index is absolutely phenomenal. So let's jump right into the big three. Let me first start off and say demand is really at an all-time high. The number of awards in Q3 exceeded 650, and we've now seen five out of six quarters hit 600 awards per quarter. We'll easily smash the record for record activity this year. The award ACV in the quarter pulled back slightly, but remained above $9 billion for five consecutive quarters. The decline was primarily due to delays in decision-making, FX headwinds, and some record high comparisons over the last six quarters. We did see some headwinds in the market, but we remain really optimistic on the overall deal flow. Second headline, margin pressure. We continue to see high inflation rates across most sectors with labor rates for the provider community increasing. You couple that with the return to travel and challenges passing wage increases to clients, and we expect to see some heavier margin pressure on service providers, which we would believe will lead to more automation, more innovation, and other productivities. I know Kathy and Namratha are going to provide more insights during the pricing discussion today. Finally, we're seeing delayed decision makings or more cautious decision making, I'd say, among our enterprise clients. We've seen some large deals delayed this quarter, and our discussions with service providers have validated the macro level concerns with these delays. The demand, though, still is at record levels, but I think defining that path forward is going to be critical for our enterprise clients. So if we take a look at the combined market ACV, it's risen steadily through 2022. We saw a slight pullback this quarter, again, primarily on FX weakness and a continued pullback in the Chinese tech sector. The combined market ACV of 23 billion is down 3% from last year and the quarter over quarter ACV edged down 1%, all of, almost all of which was due to FX weakness. Year to date, the combined market ACV of nearly 70, 79 billion is up 11.5%. The managed services market remains robust with another 9 billion quarter. It was flat year on year and then slipped 2% from the prior quarter. Again, primarily due to some timing of deals really driven by a strong summer holiday season. But the 661 contracts awarded thing this quarter marks the fourth time in the fast past five quarters that the number of awards came in above 600. There were three mega deals awarded in the quarter, the lowest number since 2Q17. But again, we really think it was a timing issue though versus an overall decline in the number of large deals. The managed services ACV year to date hit an all-time high of more than 27.5 billion. This was a 6.2% increase over 2021. The as a service posted its first year over year decline since Q since first quarter of 2015. The ACV of 14 billion this quarter dipped almost 3.6% year over year and was flat compared to the prior year. There does appear to be some pullback broadly across the SaaS market in multiple segments, and Stanton's going to hit on that on some of the trends later in the call. We saw the overall as a service market though delivered 44 billion of ACV year to date 
and it's still up 15% compared to the same period in 2021. The as a service business now accounts for 61% of the global market ACV. So Kathy, you wanna walk us through some of the pricing pressures that are going on in the market? Sure, Steve. Um, we've received a lot of questions lately from both enterprises and providers on pricing. Um, and as we've said on previous calls, we do see pricing power for in-demand based project work, but not at the same levels um, of increases for managed services or more commodity based services. This is creating some contrast in the market, which can be helpful for our enterprises obviously looking to re, uh, optimize their costs, especially given um, the recent economic headwinds that Steve has uh, reviewed with you. But it's also putting uh, margin pressure on providers. Now, it's important to keep in mind that in the provider industry, margin is not just about pricing. There's many other levers that impact their profitability, and some are in their control and some are not. We decided to take a deeper look at what's happening with provider margins. And with the analysis, what we did is we looked at a weighted average year-on-year -year margin growth for a basket of 25 providers. This included ITO providers as well as BPO per pure play firms. Now, when we look at the chart, it shows that the quarters prior to Q3 2020, margins were on a flat or slightly slowering trend of between two and 4%. Now, during the pandemic, margins sky skyrocketed, and as we've reviewed, some of the reasons for that are travel and related visa spending dramatically declined, uh, the bench was cleared, resource utilization increased, salary increases were paused, and um, in an uncertain world, attrition plummeted. Now, you can see margin growth has slowed again, and this time, uh, below, just slightly below levels from 2019. Now, the next thing we decided to do was lay the weighted revenue line on the chart for the same 25 providers. This shows margin and revenue moved in concert until around Q2 of 2020. And then the margin and revenue um, increase, uh, both increased um, with revenue sometimes in a range of 17% increases. And now, as we've discussed, we've seen unprecedented levels of demand, again, still for digital transformational services as they become integral into driving top line growth. Um, even given the slight mess market hesitation in some areas. So in our view, margin gains from 2020 and early 2021 have been lost, but let's not say lost. They're now back to or close to where they were in 2019. So more of a normalization. This seems like it's a good story. It shows that the gains during the pandemic were a little bit of a blip and we're getting back to a more normal range. Now we don't comment on what will happen to margins going forward, but we will continue to take a look at it. But we are also sure that pricing declines in managed services, competition uh, will continue to happen. So we will be looking at pricing, utilization, attrition against the total market and continue to report on it. Namratha is now going to take us through considerations related to the delivery of services and the impact it may have on margins. Namratha, over to you. Thank you, Kathy. The delivery organization, it's gone through its share of turbulence in the last few quarters. While there are tailwinds pushing things through, I think there are enough headwinds still posing a challenge to these organizations. That said, gradually things seem to be settling because our data indicates that the attrition is stabilizing. On an annualized basis, half of the providers are decreasing attrition and nearly 30% of them showing signs of stabilizing. But attrition is still at elevated levels. Even the enterprises are facing attrition challenges. They're struggling to find the right skill sets. So now they're looking to partner with service providers to help fill in these gaps and then keep the projects moving. Now to meet the demand requirements, providers were aggressively hiring in the recent past and several companies hired freshers and masses. But in current scenario with uncertainties prevailing in the market, most companies have drastically slowed down or paused hiring. Though there is a strong intent to hire, companies are prioritizing and are into more focused hiring. Also, there's a renewed focus on training employees, especially the batches of freshers who are gradually becoming productive. Kathy, as you mentioned, there is enough pressure on the margins. No doubt, wage inflation is a significant contributor because talent scarcity still persists in the market. Certain key skills come at a premium price and most importantly, replacement costs are much higher. So now the focus is more on talent retention. Besides, the era of great reshuffle is not completely over and is now prevalent amongst experienced talent. Also, there is a de developing demand for nearshore and onshore talent. Combination of these developing demands, talent scarcity, companies are opening to hiring across borders to keep the delivery strong and moving. 
So there are a number of factors that are impacting the provider margins. We will obviously continue to monitor the situation. With that, let me hand it over to Steve to walk us through the managed services trends. Steve, over to you. Yeah, excellent insights, Kathy and Amrata. I think we're going to continue to be under a, a lot of different pressure, so it's it's good to see how the market is responding. So let's jump in and take a look at the global broader market on the managed services side. So on this quarter, we're really going to take a year-to-date view, and let's start with the ITO sector. So through the first nine months of 2022, ITO globally accrued more than $19 billion in ACV. This is 2% shy of the record-breaking amount in the nine-month total in 2021, but you can see a very healthy market. A pickup in the third quarter really offsets some site declines that we saw in the first two quarters of the year. ADM continued to be on a record-breaking pace. It now accounts for 60% of the total ITL deal, deal flow and ACV. The ACV for the infrastructure deals was up slightly in Q3, but remains 8% down year over year, with all three regions really reporting a pullback on a year-to-day basis in the infrastructure space. The BPO markets, though, just had its best nine-month performance. It posted an ACV of over $8.3 billion, which was a 32% spike over last year. The robust first half of 2022 more than made up for a slight dip in Q3, and we saw a record 640 BPO contracts signed uh, year-to-date. Several of the largest sectors have really large have really logged some large gains. Industry-specific BPO rocketed 71% over 2021 numbers. Most of that activity came from the Americas as enterprises really heavily invested in strong data and analytics capabilities. The engineering segment continued its brisk pace. Its ACV rose 19% year over year to 1.8 billion, with EMEA particularly active in this area. Contact center BPO and digital customer experience also rebounded with an ACV of 1.6 billion, the highest really since 2015. And BPO activity in the financial services sector really doubled in uh, year to date and energy and travel and transportation also registered nice gains. So we're seeing good broad um, growth in the BPO space across all markets. So Stan, you wanna walk us through the as a service space? Thanks, Steve. Let's start with infrastructure as a service. Year-to-date ACV was up 18%, but that's actually the lowest growth rate for IaaS since we started reporting on this segment back in 2015. And the slowdown in growth here is primarily being driven by the big four Chinese hyperscalers. They've seen an exodus of some key customers. There was a major data breach last quarter. And of course, we have the macroeconomic impact of the strong dollar. On the other hand, the big three US hyperscalers AWS, Azure, and Google have really carried the IaaS segment so far this year. However, as we discussed on the Insider a few weeks ago, we do see growth slowing there as well. AWS has exposure to retail, which has been under a lot of pressure lately. Google has exposure to ad tech, and Microsoft has exposure to enterprise tech spending, which, as Steve mentioned, is becoming more cautious. Okay, let's take a look at software as a service now. ACV was up 7% year-to-date, but like IaaS, that's the lowest growth rate we've seen since 2015. And we see some interesting trends emerging in the SaaS sector. As you can see on this chart, we see a bifurcation happening this year. Some of the SaaS stalwarts like CRM and collaboration have been declining ACV year-to-date, while other areas like IT service management, HCM, analytics, and BI have seen ACV growth of over 30% year to date. So given that we're starting to see some more cautious enterprise decision making, we think one of the sectors this change in sentiment is hitting first is with some of the big SaaS vendors. SaaS implementations are getting bigger and more complicated as many vendors move beyond their traditional beachheads. So this slowdown in SaaS could continue as enterprises become more cautious in their spending. Okay, so let's take a look at our leaderboard now. As a reminder, our rankings are based on annual contract value over the trailing 12 months, and providers are listed in alphabetical order. And if you're interested in the regional leaderboards, you can access those at index.isg-1.com. So we saw very little turnover in the three largest categories, though each category had at least one new entrant. In the Big 15, Deloitte signed a considerable amount of applications-related work in the healthcare and manufacturing sectors. 
In the Building 15, Amdocs return to the leaderboard. They provide software and services in the communication and media sectors. In the Breakthrough 15, French ERD firm Alton made its debut. And it's one of the firms that's really benefited from the surge in engineering activity that Steve mentioned earlier. The Booming 15 category saw five new or returning entrants. Among them are Persistent Systems, a product engineering firm focused in the financial services, healthcare, and high tech sectors, and IT service provider CoForge, who signed multiple awards in the financial services and transportation sectors. Okay, so let's jump into our regional updates. Kathy, over to you for an update on the Americas. Thanks, Stanton. The Americas market continues to contract a bit. Once again, its combined market ACV posted a quarter on quarter decline. Although its ACV of about 12.5 billion edged up a percent year on year, it is down 2% from the prior quarter year on year. Quarterly declines are rare in the Americas, and this back-to-back -back slump was the first since the mid-2016. Now, year-to-date ACV of 38 billion reflects growth of 19% over last year. That's smaller than in 2021, but it's better than 12 to 14% range of prior years. Managed Services quarterly ACV stayed above the 4.5 billion mark for the fifth consecutive quarter. Still, that marks an 11% year-on-year drop, although it was against a very difficult compare. The managed services sector has been on a strong growth trajectory of about 25% per quarter, with the number of contracts exceeding 300 for the seventh quarter in a row, a sign of a very uh, healthy market. Year-to-date ACV of more than 14 billion was the highest ever at this point uh, in the year in the Americas, with the number of contracts awarded up 8% from the prior year. As a service ACV of nearly 8 billion uh, represents 9% year-on-year growth, but a 2% dip from the prior quarter, the best of the three regions, but it is far below the 40% average growth rate of the previous five quarters. Year-to-date, as a service ACV, top 24 billion, and its growth rate of 29% year-on-year is the highest since 2018. As a service ACV now accounts for 63% of the combined market in the Americas. Now I'll hand it over to Steve and he'll give us the update on EMEA. EMEA's combined market ACV of 7.6 billion continued to set new benchmarks with three consecutive quarters now of record highs. Though we saw some pullback on a quarter over quarter basis, it was really due to the FX headwinds that we saw in August and September. So year to date, the combined market ACV of nearly 23 billion rose more than 15% over 2021 and was really almost three times the growth rate of the 5 to 6% growth rate that we saw in 2019 and 2020. So we really a healthy market here. The EMEA managed services sector continued to contribute record deal volume with over 280 deals awarded in Q3. The ACV remained in the 3.8 billion territory now for three consecutive quarters. And though the market was down 3% on a quarter over quarter basis, again, based on timing and the FX headwinds we discussed, over 200 basis points of that quarter over to quarter decline was FX with really the shifts in the Euro and the pound, again, kind of going in that August, September period. Doc produced a billion dollar quarter, which was up triple digits year over year. The UK snapped its string of consecutive billion dollar quarters at three, but it's still up 15% on a year to date basis. And year-to-date managed services ACV of 11.5 billion rose 9% from the prior year. We saw over 798 contracts signed, the most in any three-quarter period in EMEA. The as-a-service ACV also grew, exceeding 3.5 billion for the fifth quarter in a row. It's 3.8 billion in ACV, marks a 5% growth year over year, and a 1% rise quarter over quarter. EMEA was the only region to post gains on both a year-over-year -year and a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis. The year-to-date ACV of $11.5 billion was up 23% over the prior year, and as a service now makes up half of the combined market in the ACV region. Namratha, you want to walk us through Asia-Pacific? Thank you, Steve. Combined market ACV in Asia-Pacific was just over $3 billion this quarter. That was down 29% year-on-year, but up 3% quarter-on-quarter. Year-to-date ACV was just was down 14% from last year, the steepest decline since 2015. That said, managed services ACV this quarter was up 17% year-on-year, but down 11% sequentially. India and Southeast Asia markets 
were strong this quarter, while Japan, China pulled back, and the number of awards in this region dropped 12 percent year on year. On a year-to-date basis, managed services ACV of $2 billion was up 2 percent over the prior year. More than 75 percent of that ACV came from new scope awards, the most ever for that sector, and on a year-to-date basis, number of awards also reached a new high. As the service ACV fell below the $3 billion quarterly benchmark, for the first time in last five quarters, which was a 37% year-on-year decline, which is a similar result to what happened in the second quarter. Big part of the decline is due to the fact that Chinese tech companies have suffered a lot during 2022, given the intense regulatory environment and country's zero COVID policy. And finally, year-to-date basis as a service generated over eight and a half billion in ACV and that was down 17 percent from 2021. Stanton, let me hand it over to you for the industry trends. Thanks, Namratha. So as usual, we're looking at these industry results on a year-to-date basis. So let's start with financial services, which makes up around a quarter of the total combined market ACV. The BFSI combined market generated almost 16 billion in ACV. That's an all time high. And that was up 23% over 2021. BFSI managed services ACV was up 29% from last year. And most of that growth came from the Americas and Asia Pacific, while as a service was up 18% year to date. So the market forces that are at play right now have complex and sometimes countervailing impacts in the financial services sector. But on the whole, we see BFSI firms focusing on transforming financial services operations. So things like lending, core banking, and mortgage processing, using a combination of managed services, platforms, fintech partnerships, and internal re-engineering. Manufacturing, the second largest consumer of technology services, generated 12 billion in ACV, and that was up 14% over 2021. Managed services was up 8% year to date, primarily due to growth in EMEA, and as a service was up 19% year to date. One of the reasons for growth in managed services is that we're seeing strong recent demand for cost optimization in manufacturing. And in Europe, a lot of that focus in optimization is focused on waste reduction and energy conservation. And an interesting trend we're tracking in the U.S. is that we see more mid-market firms outsourcing in order to increase speed and reduce technical debt. So that's it for our industry update. Steve, I'll turn it back over to you to close us out with a forecast. Great. So typically our third quarter calls focus on year-to-date numbers, but with the amount of change recently, I really want to kind of give a perspective on both third quarter and the year-to-date. So as we said, the managed services ACB was up 6% year to date, but the third quarter was down 1% year over year. ADM activity has reached record highs, while the legacy infrastructure is down 8% year to date, and that kind of imbalance weighed down the overall ITO markets. BPO, a little slower in the Q3, rose 32% year to date, due in, you know, primarily due to industry-specific BPO in the Americas, and engineering in Europe, which has hit new highs. But you know what? The calculus for as a service has really shifted. We expected quite a bit of turbulence in the coming six to nine months. As Stanton, you mentioned in Amratha, we had the difficulties in China with the infrastructure as a service market. The big three hyperscalers are cooling down a little bit, and we expect a little bit of softness in the software, you know, as a service space. Overall market is up 7% year to date, but it did decline 12% year on year in the uh, the third quarter. The macroeconomic environment really continues to be a concern, particularly with the impact of energy costs and the continued supply chain disruptions, which are key drivers to the inflationary pressures we're under. It's clear the central banks will continue to raise interest rates to get inflation under control. That's gonna increase the borrowing costs and eventually it's gonna suppress consumer demand. I think the varied responses by the central banks across the globe has also led to strengthening of the dollar, which puts further pressure on the global environment. And though demand is at record levels, enterprises continue to amaze us with their resiliency, there has to be a slowdown given the level of inflation that we're we're at right now. So given the overall strength of the market, we are maintaining our forecast of 3.5% growth in the managed services segment for the year. 
And as for the future of IaaS, we expect the big three hyperscalers and even Oracle to outperform as they've been doing. The weakness, though, on, on the SaaS market and the Asia pack will, will impact the overall market growth. So we're lowering our forecast for the as a service from 18% to 10.5%. So with that, let's open it up for Q&A. Adita, I'll turn it over to you and your team to kick us off. Great. Uh, thanks, Stanton, Steve, Ramatha, and Kathy for that presentation. Uh, very useful and interesting insights there. Uh, maybe a few questions on, on the back of that. Uh, you clearly show, you know, mentioned that demand has been strong year to date. Um, however, there's, I guess, a few pockets where, you know, you are seeing some signs of caution from uh, clients. So could you maybe just give us a sense of uh, where those more areas of caution are coming in from your conversations um, and sort of how do you, how should we think about, you know, maybe any divergence and trends there? Yeah, thanks a lot, Adita. Um, first of all, you're absolutely right. The demand has been just on a record pace. You know, as we talked about it, we've got four out of five quarters with over 600 contract awards, which we've never seen. So there, there's absolutely record activity in the managed services. And the ACB, as we talked about, though, it dipped a little bit it's still been steadily in that nine billion range and has really set new heights as well. You know, we keep talking about it that, you know, the compares are tough because last year was so strong that quite frankly, we're, we're staying in that same area as we see. If we see any weakness, I think it's on the larger deals that are more transformative and a slowdown in the decision making as we see. We, you know, there's so many macroeconomic headwinds right now that, that we've talked about. I think we all understand what those are. We're not seeing those really impact the enterprise spend, though, the way that we would have expected, quite frankly. Again, with demand high, uh, I think it's just some delayed decision making. So I think, you know, I hate to say lumpy quarters, but I think what we're going to see is a little variability between the quarters depending on where people, where enterprise clients are in their, their cycle. But overall, we continue to be very optimistic on, on what we see in the market. I think most of the service providers that we talk to and all of the conversations that we have also are being a bit cautious on the demand, just given some of the slowdowns, but we're not seeing any particular industry or any particular piece of work that's changing. I think those big trends that have been driving the market for the really the last three years, you know, AI, cloud, apps, engineering, industry specific BPO are really continuing. That's that's great. Um, I, I guess just following up on that as well. I mean, if I think about, um, you know, macro pressures maybe building up um, towards the end, into the end of next this year and into next year, uh, how, how do you think enterprises are going to prioritize spending, which areas do you think are more you know, critical and then have to be right. done even in you know, a weaker environment versus something we right. could look to push towards you know, later years? Yeah, so this is a brilliant question because I think there's a lot of aspects to it. I, I would say, first of all, anything that's really associated with driving top line and the whole digital transformation that's taking place in organizations is going to continue. So if we look at, you know, sector after sector, banking is moving all about customer experience and digital experience. We know what's happening in manufacturing, really driving both EV, autonomous, decarbonization. Those two sectors account for about 60% of the total ACB that's awarded on an annual basis in the market, just under, sort of just under 60%. Those two still have some very strong growth ahead of it and really a lot of key, key cycles that are driving that forward. So I think that's, that's really optimistic. I think we'll continue to see really a big push for cloud transformation. So you'll see GSIs that are supporting that. You'll see continued spend there. We may see some pullback on S4 HANA or other big large transformation efforts where there's not a solid business case yet. But I think that's going to be a short term. I think, again, we've got some energy issues which are driving a lot of the inflation. The inflation issues are certainly driving some of the FX and the different things that the central banks are having to do. 
you read most of the the news, you sort of think that that's going to calm down, sort of March April time frame, be much lower going into the back half of next year. So I think it's only just a couple quarters that if there is a slowdown a bit on demand, it's just going to be in those areas where there's not a solid business case on it right now. Kathy, I know you've looked at this as well. Any any insights from you? I think you imply this, Steve, but cost optimization, any any um, activity that really has a quick time to value, we've seen being accelerated and it's in all areas. It, it really just depends on, as you said, that business case. But if there's shorter timelines, uh, you know, one to two year return, we're seeing those deals move. Um, but other otherwise, if it's a larger deal and there's there could be there is some hesitation in, in that in those areas, just as you've indicated. Yeah. Understood. Uh, and again, I think on, on the similar lines, if you, in your presentation, you spoke about the trends in different regions. Um, again, there's a bit of a divergence you're seeing there. So uh, any, based on your conversations, how do you think that might evolve? Um, I think over the last week, you saw, you know, TCS, uh, Wipro talking about some weakness in Europe, for example. So do, do, are you seeing any again, divergence in trends by geography as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the concern in Europe has to do both with the, the situation in Ukraine and certainly the, the energy challenges over here. So I was in, you know, London yesterday. I'm in Germany today. You know, we're, you know, at, you know, sort of a buck 80 a liter, right? So as you go into the winter and you're sort of a, a buck 80 euro, you know, or, you know, a buck, you know, buck 70 a pound to do it. That's a big, big chunk out of the consumer and, and the business, right? So that is absolutely going to shift some dollars to the different areas of the thing, which is why Kathy and all of us really talk about cost optimization going there. And I don't think there's one industry that's that's safe from that, right? I think we're 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 all going to see that pullback. So I think if it's anything, there's a little bit going on there. FX is having a major impact. So anybody that reports in USD with a, you know, a large part of their business in Europe is, you know, you've seen it. Everybody's reporting on a constant currency basis and you've seen that. So I, I think, you know, seeing six, seven, maybe 800 basis points impact because of FX is probably not going to be that, that much out of the realm of possibility. I mean, when I look into next year, I think the euro is going to remain on parity with the dollar. I think when I looked earlier today, I think it was at 0.97. I think the pound and the guild is still having big issues, but I think the pound will probably settle around 112. But, you know, that's down significantly from how most of us plan the year, at, you know, 130, 140 and, and the drag on that. So and that that drag impacts enterprise clients as well on the spend. So I think it's, again, the macro versus any sort of systemic things that are going on in the broader market. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, one of the interesting things I found in the slides was you talked about the how different sectors or end markets are doing. Financial services has been really strong, um, I guess, understandable. But retail, uh, I mean, it was, it was a bit surprising to see that down you know, quite significantly, nearly 29%. Uh, so I was wondering, is, that, is there anything specific there? Maybe it's a few contracts being delayed or is it something more, um, more of a broader demand issue there? Yeah. Stan, you want to take that one? I know that's always my favorite slide, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I took it this time. Yeah, so I do. I think it is obviously the retail sector has been hit very hard of late. Um, I think you've probably seen a lot about a, a significant amount of excess inventory that um, retail ch chains need to release, and that's why, at least in the U United States, we have the pre, pre, and now even the pre Black Friday sale <laughs> happening here in the U.S. Uh, in order to move a lot of that that inventory. So I think ultimately that's, you know, that sector has been under a lot of pressure lately and I think probably will continue to be so. And I think that's why you're seeing some of those those numbers reflected there. Great. Great. That's that's uh, that's very useful. Um, maybe one more from my side before I turn it over to some of my colleagues. Uh, I, I think this might be one more for Kathy and, and Amata. You did talk about the sort of impact of wage inflation and on margins and in general the hiring uh, landscape so 
how is that looking now for some of these providers compared to maybe you see at the beginning of the year? Is there more or less pressure to find the right people and keep the people they have, uh, retain the people they already have? Kathy, do you want to go first and then maybe I can take the hiring portion? Yeah, so so we are seeing, you know, attrition slowing, obviously, uh, you know, there's been a little bit more stabilization in the market around hiring. Um, so that's been helping. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the freshers that were hired in mass are now coming online and starting to perform and deliver, uh, which has been great as well. I think Namratha has some insights around um, locations and what else we're seeing in the delivery perspective. So Namratha, you want to? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, like we met, like Kathy also mentioned, the attrition is stabilizing and uh, hiring could ease in the coming quarters. But uh, you know, the it all again depends on how the demand is. But demand is there, so hiring is still going to continue. But uh, as far as um, Attrition is concerned uh, in the next couple of quarters. I think even the provider sentiments are quite in a comfortable situation right now. Uh, unlike the frenzy that we actually saw a couple of quarters back, where uh, you know talent was, was scarcity and, and resignations was quite uh, quite high. But um, there are certain key skill sets which could still be a bit of uh, a challenge in terms of you know getting those key, uh, key skill sets. But having said, I think uh, you know it's it's a perhaps you know it's more of a comfortable comfortable situation for most of the organizations to be in compared to what it was a couple of quarters back. Yeah, and we'll continue to look at um, attrition, hiring, and you know we're also looking to see if there's layoffs. So that's something we'll be tracking you know for the next quarter. Okay, very interesting. Thanks, guys. If I can, if I can ask a question around pricing. So we, we've seen the industry uh, taking on a fair amount of wage inflation uh, through the year, um, without really the ability to pass that on uh, for existing contracts. Um, how do you how do you view the the pricing um, in the next you know one or two years? Uh, do we still have that that repricing happening now? Or you think that with you know some uh at one point we're going to get a two point of uh, over capacity which will limit uh that that pricing power yeah Fred, yeah. I'll pass that over to kathy but i think there's a couple things there if you, we, we look out the next couple years i think you know kathy wants you go through that but i think we've got to hit the next level of productivity improvement and one of the things that you saw in the pricing and the margin chart was sort of the we're back to, again, a sort of a linear model in the, the movement, right? As wages go up, margins go down, we're down to those levels. We're not growing linear or in a non-linear manner that we need to. So at some point, we've got to break that again, and we've got to get back to, you know, more of the, the value base, whether it's data, whether it's outcome based type things. And the, the market is still very much going through that. But Kathy, you want to take the specifics on the pricing? Yeah, so you're right, Fred, on the contracts that are longer term, it's really hard to go in and talk to a client about a, a, an increase just because they've had, you know, pressures um, for for premium services and some premium providers. They have been able to um, move the needle, particularly in the more transformational type contracts. The managed service areas that are deemed commoditized, um, it's much harder to move the needle because we've seen year on year decreases in those unit prices. And that's the expectation of the market. It's also a very competitive market. So um, competition isn't going away and clients are very cost conscious. So you have the balance of, yes, there's an understanding that there are inflationary pressures and wage increases, but clients are also fighting their own cost constraints and so there's this, this pressure back and forth. I think we will continue to see upward ticks in pricing, um, but they won't, they won't be a big jump. Um, we'll monitor this. So we look at all the contracts that come in that we have access to. We track and monitor where pricing is going, particularly on the unit pricing for managed services contracts. I look very closely at where I see individual rates or those are very tied to wages going. And again, we've seen wage or, or rate based um, increases for 
highly sought after skills, industry-based. Um, if you can come with a industry solution that uh, a client sees a premier value in, yes, of course, they're willing to pay for that. Um, again, cyber, cloud, all of the in-demand skills and those types of projects we have seen increases sometimes in the 15% range, but they're really holding across the board in other areas to what we would normally see year on year increases. So we'll continue to watch it um, and, and see where it goes in, in the next coming quarters. Yeah, and Fred, I think it's I think it's also important to you know just like everything, there's a lot of nuance in this. It also you know as Kathy talked about it, a lot of this depends on on kind of what's in scope. If we're talking about inf you know legacy infrastructure, so network you know network devices or a mainframe CPU hour or a gigabyte of storage or a server instance, right? There's uh, as Kathy mentioned, a lot more pressure, downward pressure on those prices, even though the the decline, the year over year decline in those prices we see is is slowing, it's still declining. And there's still an expectation that when a company signs a managed services agreement that those prices are gonna decline year over year, it's just the decline slowing. That decline <clears throat> is slowing even more in other areas that are drive where a lot of the demand is, like in applications, industry specific BPO. But I would say for a managed services award, a multi, excuse me, a multi-year award. You know, think of that as more kind of flat to slightly decreasing. The main message is we're still not seeing those those wage increases and all the other factors that Kathy and Amratha talked about around return to travel that are putting pressure on margins being passed on because on the managed services side, unlike on the project project based side, it's just an exceptionally competitive space. Yep. Okay, and so, so to stay on the on the as a service side of things, so you you forecast about a bit more than ten percent growth for the full year. Um, after I think year to date, you were at fifteen percent, right? So we have a we have a slowdown in Q four. You know, probably pretty tough comp as well. Again, this quarter, um, it, what's your kind of of more longer term outlook? I mean, are we going to exit? this year, you know, at a low level of growth, and we can keep that. Uh, and in particular, when we go into a recession next year, potentially in the US, in Europe, in the UK, I mean, how how do we think the industry, I'm not again, not talking about managed services, but right. on the, uh, as a service side, um, has the industry changed enough that some of that demand will stay through recession? Or you think that it's unavoidable that we're gonna see cuts uh, across the board that will, will li really limit growth in, uh, in, in, uh, as a service. I, I think it's split right now, Fred. And I, I think when I look at the total as a service market, we've really seen much higher growth on the hyperscaler side and the, the infrastructure as a service side. That piece of the market, as we talked about, has been pulled down globally when we throw in the Chinese four hyperscalers, right? take those out just for a second and really kind of focus on the, the Western side, you're still going to see strong growth with, with GCP, with Microsoft, with AWS. And we think that will continue from both a global perspective and a European perspective. We are seeing a bit of a pullback on SaaS, you know, as we talk through and, you know, some of the SaaS categories, we, we've seen some pullback and, you know, as Stan kind of walked through on his, it's it's sort of bifurcated a little bit on how we see that. So Stan, you want to talk about the SaaS market a little bit with that? Sure. So as we talked about on the on the slide, sort of uh, interesting some interesting trends happening. In fact, this actually kind of relates to one of the questions that just came in around HCM. So some interesting trends happening in that sector where we see ACV. So just a reminder, you know, we we look at ACV across both managed services and as a service in order to get an apples to apples comparison to be able to compare both. So as I showed, kind of an in, a interesting bifurcation happening this year where with IT service management, HCM, analytics, and BI up over 30% year to date on ACV growth versus things like PLM collaboration and e-commerce down double digits, in some cases up to 33% on an ACV basis. So um, I think ultimately uh, one of the trends that we're keeping track of here is that if you look at, at what's happening in the SaaS space, most of the really big SaaS vendors, you know, have really locked in the market for their core business. And that could be in, for example, IT service management, HR, uh, marketing. And then as we all know, those vendors are trying to expand outside 
of their traditional beachheads into things like business process workflows and into finance, for example, or into professional services automation. Those extending those core platforms outside of the core, the, it gets complicated, the projects get bigger, they get harder. And as we talked about, we do see some slowing down of some of those really big decisions. Um, ultimately, I think long term, you know, there's still so much runway for the big SaaS vendors. And, and ultimately, that's where, you know, the lion's share of enterprise software will go is to SaaS. But I think some of that slowdown right now is really related to as as um, Kathy and Steve talked about getting to val getting to value faster. And when you extend these big SaaS platforms kind of outside their core, things just slow down because you're now talking to, for example, extending your IT service management platform out to non IT users, right? Doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just slows down because it's a platform that they're maybe not familiar with. And um, so I think that's part of the reason for this bifurcation that we see happening in, in SAS right now. Thanks, Eric. Sure. Fred, did you any other questions? I think that's it from my side for the moment. I can turn it over to you for uh, for more uh, Q and A. Sure. Um, Steve, so uh, I just mentioned we got a question about HCM demand. So I'm actually looking at some of our our data as we speak. So as I just talked about uh, for HCM on the as a service side, um, that's up 37 percent year to date. So very strong year to date growth. Year over year, it's up 7% and quarter over quarter up 7%. So we've seen strong growth there on the on the as a service side or software as a service side. On the managed services side, um, we actually had a pretty tough quarter in the third quarter. Um, but overall, on a, if you compare where HCM is on its five-year average, it's up over 60% on its five-year average. Um, year over year, down about 10%. So it's definitely been down. Managed services, HCM has definitely been down year over year and year to date, but where I think um, many of those gains are getting picked up is more on the software as a service side. As we all know, more and more of that work that used to be outsourced moving towards SaaS platforms and gets automated within the software itself um, rather than outsourcing a lot of those core functions as they are more and more getting transformed and being done by platforms and providers providing kind of a light touch managed service on top of those platforms. Yeah, I thought you're, uh, I, I think you're spot on on that stand as well. When I was looking at the data on this one as well, you know, HR, traditional HR outsourcing only accounts for 4% of the total BPO business now. Mm -hmm. And it used to be one of the big three. So you really can see that whole HR outsourcing business, again, transition to more of a SaaS business as mm -hmm. it goes forward. And then services on, on top of that. So I think it's it's probably going to hang in there at you know 85 75 to 85 million you know sort of a quarter of acb mm -hmm. make it a little higher some you know a little lower <laughs> off some, but it's that whole market has changed with uh you know with the growth of SaaS there yep. you know i think we also had a question on how much of the SaaS growth or pullback was really due to fx mm -hmm. it's a little harder on fx for the SaaS providers, we, we track over 2,500 in our basket that we look at. Not everybody reports globally um, what they do. So it's much harder to, to kind of pull that back. Some of the big ones have reported where they are, but again, we, we haven't been able to say the same way that we can with managed services, what the FX impact is for, for that whole basket as we go forward. Yeah. Um, Namratha, there's a great question here on trends for alternative delivery locations. Um, any thoughts on sort of the continued heavy dependence on India-based delivery and even potentially, you know, what new delivery locations should we be thinking about? Yeah, sure, Steve. I think um, uh, it's it's more about right shoring as opposed to, you know, whether it's offshoring, nearshoring or uh, onshoring, I guess that's the approach that most companies are adopting. I did mention uh, in my section that there is uh, developing demand near shore and onshore demand. Now, one of the key things or you know, few things that could be driving uh, this particular demand is, of course, talent scarcity, as I mentioned, still exists. So there are certain key skills which might be required and providers are now probably looking at casting a wider net in terms of tapping into that talent. 
Um, of course, there is also the risk concentration or the business continuity plan for those reasons. You know, there are alternate delivery locations that is being looked at. Um, and definitely the other piece that we, we should also consider, uh, which could be driving this demand is some of the visa challenges that some of the providers in India are facing. Um, and that's another reason why they might be looking for onshore and nearshore uh, talent. But having said, within India, I think it's also uh, not just the tier one cities now. We, we know and we covered this in our index a couple of quarters back that there is aggressive expansion that is happening into tier two and tier three cities now. And there's more delivery workforce that is uh, coming on board. Uh, so offshore is still in terms of uh, you know the demand, there is enough and significant demand for offshore talent, but this could be the reasons why some of the alternate delivery locations other than India, that's kind of being looked at. Very good. Thanks for that, Namratha. Kathy, you're staying anything that you guys are seeing on, on delivery locations? We've had a lot of enterprise clients uh, query us about delivery locations and specifically asking us about Latin America, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mexico, um, Africa. Uh, so there's there's just a lot of uh, querying going on. We've done a location analysis of all of the major cities around the globe, and we've looked at um, you know what level of talent they would have across specific industry type skills as well as technology skills. What the geopolitical situations are in those countries. So what kind of delivery risks there might be. Also environmental type risks for. Um, you know, providers as well as enterprise clients expanding into those areas. But we see a lot of, um, you know, uncertainty about where the, the new delivery locations could be. Um, I think India is still obviously the beachhead for most of the technology talent just because of the, the volume of highly skilled uh, people in, in that region and in, in the country. But we have um, started to see an expansion and as I think Namratha put it really perfectly when she said right shore, what is the right place for the location based on the skills you're requiring and um, the amount of risk that is uh, accompanying those those locations? Yeah, I think that's good, Kathy. Um, I just finished up a study for a client in the European market as well. And very similar, we're looking at, you know, near shore locations, mm -hmm. Portugal, Spain, Eastern Europe are looking at the geopolitical issues in, in Eastern Europe. But Namrath, I think you nailed it. The scale isn't there, right? We can go to lots of different countries, but the scale of resources and, and things is, is very difficult to match as we go forward. Uh, interesting, I do think a lot of clients are really looking at captives again. And I think the reason they're looking at GCCs, Global Capability Centers, Global Engineering Centers, Global Innovation Centers, there's a whole bunch of new buzzwords for it is really because of the digitization that's taking place within their business. And all of a sudden, and I don't want to be cliche with it, but every company is a software company. So having key capabilities that really drive your overall software, your core asset, your top line really becomes a differentiator. And so having that sort of in-house and, and badge to employees is, is really important for a lot of clients. Um, guys, I love this new format because we're getting so many questions. <laughs> in. There, there's a really great question that just popped up on the unused capacity with the hyperscalers and could that be impacting wow. some of the infrastructure as a service piece? Mm -hmm. This is this is a brilliant question on so many levels because I think one of the things that's happened over the last two years is some really big deals that have been signed with the hyperscalers and large commit on workloads that were going to move there or revenue that was going to shift to them. The reality is that's a very slow slog right now. We haven't seen the shift of work to the hyperscalers at scale. There's a lot of reasons for it. Some of it is just hard work. Some of it is organizational change management. Some of it is DevOps and running in a multi-cloud environment. Um, I know a lot of the suppliers that are on the call, us included, are working with the hyperscalers and our clients to help this break through and, and get it. I don't think it's having a big push down on their revenue yet, but clearly from a capacity and where they want to go and their long-term vision, I, th I think it's really important. 
Stanton, I know you looked at this as well. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, you know, number one, as you talked about, a lot of framework agreements out there with large commitments to move applications to the hyperscalers. And I think given that we're now kind of past the easy phase of cloud modernization, we're in the heavy lifting phase where enterprises across every industry are looking at their industry specific applications. So think about, for example, mainframe in retail and how to modernize those applications and get them onto cloud and to one of the hyperscalers. Um, that's really where a lot of the heavy lifting is taking place now and that takes time. And that's also why, and we've been you know, talking about this a lot, a lot um, recently is that's also why we think we see such strong, strong demand for applications. So AMS and, and ADM type services is as goes cloud, goes applications. As you move to these hyperscale clouds, it's a process to rethink and refactor, rebuild and build net new cloud native applications onto these hyperscale platforms. And that's ultimately what's driving a lot of the growth, I think, in ADM. So, you know, one could argue that, you know, cloud is growing managed services. It's just growing some areas that we maybe didn't think about 10 years ago, but it's growing those areas. Yeah, that's very good. So if there was a voting button, I suspect the next question would get the most votes. So team, they want us to put on our crystal ball and give a perspective of where we think IT spend will be for 2023. Um, that's the business that we're in. So, so let's give it a shot. Um, I, I'm going to do a couple things here. So from an IT standpoint, I'll give a number. And then broadly, as you've heard us talk through, I think overall technology spend is growing in organizations. And a much bigger percentage of that overall technology spend is going to traditional service providers. So I think you've got to look at both, both, both pieces now. So IT spend, IT managed services, I don't think we're going to grow at the same rate that we did 2021, 2022. I, I do believe that, you know, 9 billion ACB per quarter is sort of a new benchmark. I think we'll hold that. When I talk to clients, when I see other research reports, I think we're going to be, let's call it the low twos, the 2.5% growth on the budget. The challenge is that's what they're going to go in at is sort of the 2.5%. If we're right about the energy issues and what that's going to mean, if we're right about the inflation and the pullback and things, that 2.5% increase is going to have to go much further. We know that there's labor increases. We know that that's, you know, for organizations probably going to be in the three or three and a half percent, excluding India. So there's lots of things that are going to compete for those dollars. But in general, I would say two and a half percent on the managed services side is what we'll see going through. Um, and I think, as Kathy, as you've mentioned a couple times, I think cost optimization will be a really key driver there. But uh, guys, challenge me on a little bit and tell me, are, are we close on that one? Yeah, I think so, Steve. And I think ultimately, I think it's also just important to keep in mind, and we've talked about this so many quarters in a row, is the growth of spending outside of IT. As we move into more of these industry-specific applications, that's ultimately where we think a lot of this growth, whether it's managed services or as a service, that's where a lot of the growth ultimately is going to come from in technology spending. Yeah, absolutely. So I think on the BPO side of the house, I think the industry-specific BPO and engineering are going to continue to grow in mid double digits, mid teens. Let me be careful here on the language that I choose in the in the 15 percent plus range. We're just seeing such a transformation of the core business driven by digitization captured as in, in you know, industry specific, you know, BPO. And engineering is just growing at crazy speed. So I think you're going to continue to see really strong growth on the engineering side, on the industry specific. The rest are going to cool. So I think we'll continue to see really good growth on BPO. And nobody thought we would have said that two years ago. So I think that's a big highlight. And engineering, as many of you heard me say, for multiple quarters now, is a really big highlight that's driving the market to new, new heights. Um, so with that, gang, I, I do want to just say um, thank you again, the 20th anniversary to the entire team. It takes a complete group to make this happen. We've had some people on this team for 20 years that have done this and just amazing. 
So Stan, you want to close this out and tell sure. us about the, uh, the next meeting? Sure. So Aditya, a huge thank you to you and the entire Bank of America team for hosting, as Steve said, the 20th anniversary call today. So as a reminder, you can access a copy of the slides from today, the regional leaderboards and answers to a lot of the questions that we didn't get to today at index.isg-1.com. So if it's your first time to visit the site, just hit the red register button and that'll get you access. And then as Steve mentioned, our uh, final, our fourth quarter call will be on Thursday, January 12th at 9 a.m. Eastern, and we'll be in touch with you soon about registering for it. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you in the new year. Outstanding. Thank you.